Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace News Roundup. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host Jean Deville. This week we're going to bring you some updates on a space deal signed between China and Ukraine, a report released by China Great Wall on the satellite communications market in the Belt and Road regions, uh, some further updates still on the uh, IPO and the recent trading of Shanxi Zhongtian. However, first, we're going to give you part one of what will be a special two-part episode of a summary of last week's China Commercial Aerospace Forum, or CCAF, hosted by Kasich in Wuhan. This is the sixth edition of the conference. It is an annual conference that has uh, been hosted in Wuhan every year, and it uh, covers some of the premier commercial aerospace companies in China. The event this year was postponed from September until uh, October. However, it was still held in person and also online, uh, which is an impressive feat given uh, what Wuhan has gone through during the course of this year. The information from this event is primarily two types. So as I mentioned, it is hosted by Kasich, and so the first type of information is a huge data dump from Kasich of all the different space projects that they are doing. So literally every single major Kasich space project had a, pretty much a, had a presentation and had some local news snippets and updates during this week. The second type of update is updates from a variety of commercial space companies that used this Kasich event as a platform for their own updates. So as I mentioned, this is going to be a two-part summary of the CCAF. This week, we're going to talk about Kasich and all of their projects uh, that were updated this year. Next week, we're going to give you an update on the commercial space companies and their activities at the CCAF. I would also add that we're going to be joined next week by an extra special, very last minute, exceptionally gifted guest who is not only one of the premier rocket people within China, but is a Chinese internet celebrity in his own right with over 500 million views. Uh, and in case that does not give it away, we will wait until the end of this episode to, to say who that is. That all being said, we have a lot to talk about today, so we will get to the introduction and uh, we will be back in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, uh, the first part of the episode today is going to be a summary of all of Kasich's projects as discussed this past week at the CCAF in Wuhan. Before we get into the specific projects, which I will give the mic to Jean in just a few moments, uh, a little bit of context about why Kasich, why Wuhan, what is the CCAF, and what has been going on for these past six years at this conference. Full disclosure, I have attended the conference twice as far as I remember, although it might be only once, although I definitely at least once. Um, neither John nor I were able to attend this year because it again was uh, half online, half in person and because of the, the virus. Um, however, it was uh, hosted by Kasich in Wuhan. And so as we mentioned in a couple of different previous episodes, the Chinese space industry has been commercializing a lot over the last five years or has been opening up a lot over the last five years. And uh, this has been done primarily by two different entities. So there are the commercial companies that are being founded by the dozens. I mean, every single year we've seen literally a couple dozen commercial space companies founded. Um, now, these companies are very small and they're starting from, if not zero, they're starting from a very small base in terms of their, their R&D capabilities and, and their teams and this kind of thing. The other factor that is starting to commercialize space are SOEs from other industries that are trying to move into space. And one of the biggest SOEs to do this is, is Kasich. And one of the reasons for this is, as we mentioned in previous episodes, Kasich's primary industries are things like missiles and defense. And these industries are not particularly elastic in their demand. So Kasich doesn't have a lot of ability to grow the market, as it were. So they need to find other commercial verticals to try to extend their business. And one of the rather more logical verticals when you're a missile manufacturer would be things like rocket manufacturing. And so Kasich has been trying to push for more commercial space activity, primarily through rockets and, and the satellite constellations that they have been developing. And this has been primarily focused on Wuhan. As we've mentioned in previous episodes, one of the big factors in the commercialization of space in China is the involvement of local governments. And in this case, you have this really interesting combination of Kasich as a really big, powerful SOE and the Wuhan government, which is a government of a, a province that has a GDP that's roughly as big as like Belgium or Thailand, 
they're working together to build a sort of commercial space hub in Wuhan. So this is the Wuhan Aerospace Industrial Base. Uh, we will call it the WAIB, or I, I will call it the, we'll see, but it's, it's, a, it's a mouthful either way. Um, so basically, KSIC has been building this Wuhan Aerospace Industrial Base over the last several years and hosting the CCAF conference. And as I mentioned, this is all taking place in Wuhan, which is a large city, but it is a, a city that is quite far from Beijing. And KSIC, what, again, as they try to commercialize an industry that has a very powerful state-owned monopoly cask that um, has a vested interest in, in maintaining the monopoly, Kasich is well suited to move out of Beijing and open their their you know push their business in places like Wuhan. So all of these factors have led to a lot of activity from Kasich in Wuhan. I mean they're literally spending billions of dollars on this Wuhan Aerospace Industrial Base, and most of the bigger successes of Chinese commercial space companies. So for example, things like the first successful rocket launch by a commercial space company. Um, or a lot of the, the first sort of specific LEO tests by commercial space companies have been done by KSIC subsidiaries that are based in Wuhan. So there's a lot of KSIC activity here. And this conference every year is sort of a platform for all of these projects to show what is, you know, what are they up to? What kind of things are they doing? And, and I guess more importantly, in the context of the conference, what is their economic impact on the province of, of Hubei and on the city of, of Wuhan? And this kind of brings me to to my next point, and which, which brings us to the conference uh, specifically this year, and then I will give it to Sean just momentarily. Um, every year at this conference, the first morning of the conference is a sort of half-day session with all of the Chinese space industry represented. So again, KSIC is the host, they are the biggest ones there, but then CASC will have a speech, and the CNSA and the CETC, the China Electronics and Technology Corporation, and it will be attended by the local, like the mayor of Wuhan and probably the vice governor of Hubei province. And then after this half day session, the mayor and the vice governor will go with the chairman of KSIC and they will go around the exhibition hall and look at all the booths and see all of the nice economic activity being brought to, to Wuhan and to Hubei by, by KSIC. And this ultimately, I think it, it shows you what the, the very end purpose of the conference is at the very highest level, which is to say KSIC is, you know, furthering its relationship with the local government and trying to to find ways to, um, I guess, improve that relationship, as it were. And then most of the commercial activity and most of the talks by the commercial companies that occur are kind of a, a you know, they, they, are, they are using this, this bigger platform for their purposes. So I think this is um, important context to, to consider the CCAF uh, within. And so I think um, that, that all being said, um, after this first day half conference, uh, sorry, after this first day half uh, half half day uh, session, um, we had a number of different sort of sub forums that were primarily uh, focused on different applications that KSIC has some commercial space activity in. And so, Jean, you were you certainly went through probably more of the half day con uh, panels than than I did, although I, I certainly had a look at, at a lot of them as well. But would you like to uh, to give us a bit of an intro on some of the bigger projects from KSIC that were discussed this week and, and some of your takeaways? Um, from, from those projects. Sure, absolutely. Um, so just quick hello to our listeners. Um, I'd like to add one quick uh, piece of information of context before getting to the sub forums. Um, so um, just just to give a few names, throw out a few names on the K6 uh, commercial space projects. There are quite a few of them. You have the five Yun projects, uh, among which you find Xing Yun and Hong Yun, so the emblematic constellation projects of KSIC. Um, you also have three other uh, Yun projects um, that are a bit funkier stuff and we discussed in um, episode five of Dongfang Hour if you're interested in that. Um, among other projects, you also have XBase, that's the uh, commercial launch vehicle spinoff. You also have other companies uh, that KSIC, KSIC is doing in commercial space, um, such as High Wing, uh, Titan. Uh, you also have KSIC Cloud, you have others. And all these companies uh, that are linked to KSIC that are commercial um, had a lot of, um, that were present at CCAF and had um, the opportunity to present themselves and their products um, through these sub forums. So all that was very interesting. And let me just start unpacking what was in these sub forums. And I'll start with, with constellations, if that's okay. Um, so the first topic I want to bring up is, is Xing Yun. Xing Yun is probably the most discussed um, topic when talking about K6 um, commercial space endeavors. That's probably because this company is um, based in Wuhan, Wuhan being the city where, uh, as Blaine, you, you, you said, um, where the CCAF was uh, taking place. And it's also 
in my opinion, one of the most advanced projects, commercial space projects of Kasich um, with XSpace. So all these reasons make it quite a big thing. And their deputy general manager, Mr. Du Lee, he gave um, a presentation in the second sub forum, which was very interesting. Not any sensational revelations, but a lot of background information on what Xingyun has been doing. And they they also showed, a, they showed during this presentation a very neat timeline that I will put up um, uh, in this uh, YouTube video. And what you realize is that Xingyun um, is a three-phase project. You have the alpha phase, you have the beta phase, and you have the gamma phase. So what the alpha phase is, a phase, the first phase that's taking place in 2020, and it is a um, technology demonstration phase where K6 sends up two satellites, Xingyun, uh, dash 01 and 02, which were sent into space um, this year in May 2020. And they do a whole battery of tests on the with these two satellites on the ground, and we'll get back to that in a, in a couple minutes. Um, there's the beta phase, which is to take place in 2021. So that is sending 12 satellites into space in batches of six satellites. So that's two launches on um, on K6 uh, Kwaijo 11 launchers. And what's interesting here is in the beta phase, these 12 satellites are already, should be delivering um, actual services to actual customers. So it's, it's already operational, although it doesn't have a worldwide coverage. Um, another interesting thing that they mentioned during the presentation was some um, technical um, characteristics. So I noted, for example, that um, the revisit time over a given area would be less than 30 minutes for a given zone. And, um, and also another interesting point is they're planning to build two ground stations during the beta phase in Egypt and South Africa. So I am guessing that um, the African continent will be part of the covered zone in phase beta. And the last um, phase is phase gamma. And what that is, um, is in 2023, um, um, Xingyun will be providing a full 80 satellite constellation worldwide coverage to its clients. So um, so yeah, I, I guess that's the end game for, for Xingyun, worldwide coverage of their narrowband services. Um, and another very interesting piece of information that was shared uh, during the conference is all the work they, they've been doing because Xingyun is a project that dates back to 2016. So I, it's been four or five years and I hear sometimes whispers here and there of like, you know, what has Xingyun actually been up to? Look at Starlink, they've been massively deploying their satellites. Why is it moving slightly slower uh, for Xingyun and Hongyun and the other um, Chinese state-owned constellations? And what you realize here is that sending satellites into space is just a small part of the, of the work. You have to do a lot of work on the ground. And this is what really um, was visible during Dooley's uh, presentation. You realize that they, for example, they set up their uh, um, TTNC control center um, in Wuhan. They've also really set up all the satellite manufacturing facilities, um, including EMC chambers, thermo vacuum chambers, uh, vibration platforms, and just other production lines for their uh, batch production of their satellites. Um, and I also, I think the most important point is you realize they, that they've been doing so much work regarding um, the various sub verticals that would be using their services. So they did technical demonstrations with um, maritime applications, notably containers on ships. You have disaster relief, you have meteorology, you have hydroelectricity, you have oil and gas, you have forestry disaster. I mean, just so many applications. And these were actually not just uh, technical demonstrations. You realize that Xingyun today is developing in-house um, some of the terminals, the commercial terminals that will be uh, used by the end users in a, in a, in a couple of years. So that was also uh, quite interesting to see that you have a model where you have the uh, uh, satellite operator, the constellation operator, build also some of the t uh, terminals, although they also mentioned that they were partnering up with some domestic electronics manufacturers. So you'd have some, um, you know, third party companies building some of the terminals and um, Leobit, which is the company behind Xingyun, probably building um, the other terminals. So a lot of work being done. And um, what, do you have any thoughts on that, Blaine, on the maybe the level yeah. of readiness of this company? In well, I mean, yeah, Xingyun was, was an interesting one. So that that, that uh, talk by, by Du Li was, was really, really good. There were a few different takeaways that I was kind of struck by. So first is kind of the the level of vertical integration that Kasich very clearly has in, in this whole kind of system that they're building out. So during the Xingyun project, uh, Du had specifically said that they were going to, as you, as you mentioned, they're going to use the Kwaijo 11 to launch the Xingyun satellites. Um, and, and I guess not directly related to Xingyun, but, but more related to the conference, the fact that it was hosted, I think, on Kasich's cloud service. And it was an example of Kasich's um, trying to build out this kind of integrated infrastructure of, of I guess, connectivity and kind of uh, 
well, connectivity as it were. Um, so yeah, that vertical integration was, was interesting and, and that sort of just the example of this that we had of K6 different sort of products as, as it were. Um, the other thing, as, as you mentioned, is sort of the the applications they're trying to develop and just their ability to iterate. So I think one thing that, that we talk a lot about with Starlink, you know, having 800 satellites is, oh, they're getting so much data on their users and they're going to be able to iterate and improve their satellites and, and make it better and all this. And that, that may be true, but um, I, it seems that Xingyun is getting, oh, I mean, obviously not as much data, but they're getting data, they're doing actual tests with two satellites. So at a much smaller scale, they are still doing some tests and getting some data and, and doing some iterations, presumably. And and also related to applications, it was interesting when, when watching this talk, he showed the the organizational structure of Xingyun, and they had so many departments for different applications. It was like two thirds of the slide of this big organizational tree was just different application departments. And it was like, wow, there's they, they must have a lot a lot of people doing that. Um, and then I guess the last thing that was an interesting point from Xing Yun was the scale of the constellation. So as you mentioned, 80 satellites by 2023 and the, the gamma phase, but then he also uh, do mention towards the end of his talk, um, planning to have roughly 200 satellites within the 14th five-year plan. So by 2025. Um, and so that was interesting. I mean, uh, they, uh, they certainly uh, nowadays that seems, you know, relatively pedestrian in terms of how ambitious is that to say we, you know, if they get to 80 by 2023 and then launch 120 more in those two years, they, well, Starlink launches 120 satellites per quarter, um, or more than that. But um, still, interesting that that was the first I had seen of that scale for Xing Yun. Um, so yeah, definitely some some interesting updates from Xing Yun. That was cool. That was an interesting talk from from Duvi and from uh, the other. And uh, maybe a last detail on Xingyun that I noticed as well during the conference, and then I'll move on to uh, Hongyun, the other constellation, is that, um, well, when you look at the image of the test, you also have often logos of the companies they're working with. So you get an idea of the potential end users that um, they'll be using their systems. And what you saw was a lot of uh, local governments, the Hubei government, Hebei, uh, you had Tibet, you had Gansu, you had others. And so I think it also makes a lot of sense because for you know fighting fires, disaster relief, for meteorology, these are very likely going to be uh, local government agencies doing this sort of work. And you also saw some companies, so they were mainly state-owned companies. You had a subsidiary of China Rail, working for um, building containers. And you also had CIMC, which is a publicly traded company that's based in Shenzhen. Um, very big company, also making containers, but also other airport facility um, uh, equipment, I believe, as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's local government on one side, and you also have the large uh, state-owned and Chinese um, companies on the other, who will probably be the end users. Um, so yeah, I'm going to move on to Hongyun, Hongyun being the other emblematic constellation of uh, Kasek. And so Hongyun being the, um, the large broadband constellation, initially a project of 156 satellites, I think. And they moved on to, an, uh, well, they modernized the project into an 864 satellite constellation in recent years. Um, and so again, there was, we had a presentation from their deputy director that was um, Mr. Wang Chong. And so, a lot, very interesting discussion. Again, no really big um, revelations, but here a lot of background information. Again, half of the talk was basically on talking about other constellations outside of China. Actually, we talked. They, they spoke about Iridium. They spoke about um, Starlink, about OneWeb, and so that was that was interesting. Um, and they also discussed some of their technical solutions for Hongyun and uh, compared to these other constellations. So um, what seems to be confirmed here is that Hongyun will be using intra-satellite links. They'll be using beam hopping technology, and they will also be doing a lot of onboard processing on their satellites as opposed to doing a lot of the processing on the ground within those ground stations. So that's the first point. And the second point also was there was a lot of discussion on uh, hybrid payloads. So what I call hybrid payloads, probably not the, the best name actually, but it's uh, basically putting some when you have a satellite with um, some broadband payload, you have some narrowband payload, but maybe, hey, you mix that a little bit with some Earth observation, you have some GNS enhancement, you have a mix of multiple types of payloads. And so um, during the presentation, uh, they discussed the Iridium, which is Iridium Next, which has uh, which is predominantly um, L-band payload on the satellites, but he had a little bit of K-band. And they also mentioned that, you know, you had um, some ADSB payload, you had some Earth observation payload also on those satellites. Um, and um, 
And this is actually a very hot topic in China currently. They, they call it Tong Dao Yao, Tong Dao Yao, which basically means mixing, mixing comms, Earth observation, and uh, GNSS. And they're not, I mean, Hongyun is not the only company talking about this. And so I am wondering today, even though the test satellite that Hongyun sent into space in 2017 or 2018 is predominantly with K band transport, transponders, I'm wondering. Um, maybe the end constellations that they're planning to send. I wouldn't be surprised after all this talk if there was a mix of multiple um, payloads on their constellation. And I guess that would also be a differentiating factor with the other large broadband constellation of China, which is Hongyan. And it would make more sense because today having two uh, very large broadband constellations, Hongyan and Hongyun, competing uh, from within China, um, well, that is a bit of a problem, I think. And um, there were also talks um, here and there, hints in September this year and, and also in March and April this year that potentially there could be a consol consolidation of these um, two um, constellations. So I, get I guess this is an interesting way to um, have Hongyun have its, its own purpose if it's to survive on, it, on its own. Um, any thoughts on, on Hongyun, Blaine, or just these, this constellation? Yeah, so just I guess one one interesting point that I, I had also definitely highlighted this uh, this phrase from the presentation was the uh, as you mentioned the, the Tong uh, Tong Dao Yao, uh, which the, it's interesting because the I guess the the second the second half of that phrase when often used in that presentation was Et Hua, yeah. So the the uh, you know integration of, of the of these three things. So as you said, this idea of of integration of these three things is really um, it it. Again, I think it's an indication of the extent to which Kasich is trying to, and others are trying to build out this really integrated network of, of just kind of data collection, th things that are collecting data, whether, whether that data is, is location data or, or visual data or, or communications data or some combination thereof, um, and getting that data you know, onto the cloud or to some central location or, or you know, whatever it is. Um, I think it's, just, it's a really interesting um, topic to, to watch, this, this integration. And, and it's uh, something that, as you said, other companies in, in both China and, and Russia and the US um, and other, I guess Europe as well, presumably like Western Europe would, would have talked about. So yeah, it's an interesting topic for sure. Um, nothing else from my end on Hong Yun. I think that was, you know. Great, then let's move to the last um, company that I want to talk about um, regarding CCF, which is XSpace. So XSpace is the launch vehicle manufacturer, commercial launch vehicle manufacturer of Kasich, and they obviously also had a presentation. This time it was Fan Wei, the chief designer. Again, no big um, new piece of information here, but a lot of interesting discussion during his presentation on the economics of um, solid rockets, because today it is recognized in X I mean, XSpace recognizes it as well, that um, from the point of view of cost efficiency, liquid propulsion and normally reusable liquid rockets are much more cost efficient than solid rockets. So the question here was, what is the m market out there uh, for solid rockets once we take that into account? And basically what, um, what XSpace put forward, what Fanway put forward was the fact that you have you have really two markets. You have the markets that really strive for cost efficiency, and that's, for example, massively deploying a satellites um, for for constellation. But there are also markets that are looking for responsiveness, and you know, be able being able to um, launch a satellite on maybe a couple of weeks or one or two months' notice. Um, and so the example he gave here was actually a contract that Iridium had uh, with Relativity Space. So Iridium, um, they deployed their latest constellation through Falcon 9 launches. So that is presumably the cheapest you can get today on the market. Um, but they also had six spares on the ground and they had a market with, uh, they had a deal, sorry, with Relativity Space for their Tehran 1 rocket. Uh, and in, you know, in case of need, in case of a breakdown, I don't know, um, well, Relativity Space would be able to send one of those spare satellites into space. Now, what is interesting here is uh, Relativity Space's rocket, Tehran 1, is actually a meth loss rocket. It's not a solid, it's not solid rocket propulsion, but the example is interesting and relevant because um, the whole uh, added value of Relativity Space here is, is you know, just 3D printing the entire rocket, and the advantage of that is being able to build an entire rocket in less than 60 days. So it's still the idea that there is a market for uh, for responsiveness. So that was that was the first point, and the last interesting point that um, that was brought up for me in the presentation was um, well that the fact that they acknowledged that there was growing competition even for solid rockets within China. You have One Space, for example, which is a company that historically fo 
focused on solid rockets. You have companies like iSpace or like Galactic Energy. Uh, you have others um, like um, China Rocket and uh, Junko Aerospace. These companies are also bringing to the market these small uh, solid rockets. And so X Space has the advantage of being um, in the business for already a couple of years. And what they put forward is that the fact that their Kwaijo one rocket is extremely reliable, apart from the failure that they had, one failure they had this year, uh, before it was, uh, before that it was really um, flawless. They also uh, put forward that their rocket is able to be operational really rapidly. They have a high level of customization. They have the ability to really put satellites into precise orbits. And, um, and also it is a very safe rocket, according to them, because they have landing control, um, sort of um, look, looks like grid fins basically and enables, to, uh, enables them to narrow down the area where they think the rocket, the first stage will fall back down to the earth. So this is all the advantages that they're putting forward vis-a-vis um, -vis their competitors in China. And I think what is interesting here is you realize that really cost efficiency is not the only factor. Uh, there's responsiveness, but there's also other factors like how accurate you're going to be able to de deliver the satellites into orbit and, and other factors. So um, I think they will put up a fierce fight in the next two years uh, once the other um, private launch companies will um, have their rockets launching on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, that's that's all I have for uh, for X Space. Um, do you have any comments on that, Blaine, or um, or do, do we move on to um... yeah, a couple of quick comments on X Space? Then we'll move into into Ukraine, which is always a fun place to, to move into. Um, so X Space, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was it's interesting your your point about the the competition. Um, from these other launch companies that certainly that that will be a factor moving forward i guess x space has a big advantage in having the sort of um internal demand as it were of again xingyun and hongyun and and also i think mm. x space is there being the market leader now has given them the advantage of establishing what appear to be quite deep relationships with specific kind of strategic customers. So for example, uh, they've launched a number of satellites for Charming Globe, which is one of the leading Earth observation manufacturers and, and operators in, in China. Um, and they also have done a big publicity stunt with Charming Globe. And, and they're, they're both kind of kindred spirits insofar as being sort of nominally commercial, but rather state controlled at the end of the day in, in some way. Um, so yeah, I think X-Base, I mean, they will certainly, and, and I, yeah, they will certainly face some additional competition, but uh, they have a big head start, I, I suppose. I thought it was interesting that their um, Cao Meng from, from X-Base had appeared on local media uh, after, during the conference, mentioning they'd be producing 50, saddle, uh, 50 rockets per year um, at the Wuhan Aerospace Industrial Base um, within an unspecified time frame. But um, yeah, they, they seem to have, he used the phrase uh, very often, so like the, the uh, process to, to, to do processes in batches basically they have achieved that that technological uh, level of sophistication I guess so yeah it'll be an interesting company to watch uh, X base um, yeah so I think that wraps up our coverage for the CCAF for this week again next week we will come back with uh, some updates on the private companies and their updates at the CCAF we will also uh, be bringing in a guest, uh, the aforementioned Sao Meng from X-Base will be joining us next week for a short discussion on the CCAF, a couple of questions uh, that we will be asking him. Um, so that all being said about the CCAF, we will move into just a couple of other news items for this week. Uh, so China and Ukraine signed a long-term cooperation agreement for space. Uh, the cooperation agreement encompasses 69 projects that are totaling over 70 million US dollars and is covering the period of 2021 to 2025. There are currently not a lot of details available on this project in English or in Chinese. However, I have not done a detailed search in Ukrainian. So if we have any Ukrainian listeners, I would be very happy if you could have a look. Uh, that being said, the couple of specific projects that were mentioned were a joint space research laboratory, which would presumably be carried out on the Chinese Large Modular Space Station, uh, which is going to be launching over the next few years, and also stronger information exchanges between the two countries, which is a not particularly specific phrase. Um, just a very little bit of background on China and Ukraine in space. Uh, so earlier this year, there were some comments made by Ukraine's Vice Prime Minister for EU and Euro Atlantic integration, uh, Dmitro Kuleba, uh, who was saying that Ukraine needs to decrease trade barriers with China and enhance cooperation, including, uh, he mentioned at the time, in the domain of space. So it's interesting that a 
Vice President, uh, sorry, Vice Prime Minister uh, for EU and Euro Atlantic Integration for the country of Ukraine is uh, talking about the importance of integration with China. Um, anything from you, Jean, on the Ukrainians and uh, what they are getting up to, or is that? No, maybe I'll just add one comment. It's I, for me, it makes sense that Ukrainian would seek this sort of. Um, relationship with China because um, historically the Ukrainian industry has been uh, tied to a lot of Russian space projects and with the um, uh, rather sharp um, downturn that has taken this relationship in recent years it is only logical that they find they look for other partners in order to maintain their level of knowledge which is significant and their involvement in, in, in space so makes sense. Indeed. And just the last points for this week, a report released by China Great Wall Industry on satellite communications demand in the Belt and Road region, uh, which is featuring a significant amount of data and analysis from EuroConsult. Um, so basically just a little bit of context. As we've mentioned before, China Great Wall has uh, the interesting position of being the company within CASC that does business with the outside world. And so they sell pr predominantly communication satellites, but also EO satellites and others to foreign countries. And so as the Belt and Road Initiative has become a bigger and bigger thing, there's obviously been a lot of people within China and outside of China saying, there's all these Chinese companies in remote places, they should have demand for SATCOM and therefore there should be a Chinese you know, Belt and Road satellite. And implicitly, if you had a, a company outside of China buying such a satellite, for China, they would be buying it through China Great Wall. So uh, this is, uh, it's an interesting report for sure, but I would say that it is a report where the publisher of the report, China Great Wall, certainly has an incentive to, to hope that the market for communication satellites across this region is very large. And that is perfectly understandable. I am not saying that they are incorrect in that, but it's just, just so everyone knows uh, the context for that report. And again, it is an interesting report on on the region and on the market. So, uh, John, did you uh, have any, any thoughts on, on the Belt and Road uh, and on that report in general? Yeah, I had a quick read uh, on the report. I think definitely um, there are some figures that should be taken with a pitch of salt. For example, I thought that um, their evaluation of the in-flight connectivity market in China is a bit inflated uh, in the coming years. But overall, it's also really interesting to see uh, how uh, China Great Wall, uh, so the main, as you said, the main commercial arm of CASC, um, um, sees um, the markets in China in the Belt and Road. So it's definitely um, worth a read for sure. They're coming for me here. We've got the sirens going, so that's good. I mean, we're gonna, that's probably a sign that we ended. Um, so again, uh, next week we will be having part two of the CCAF summary. We will also, we are very happy to announce that our next uh, guest for a deep dive one hour episode will be my close friend and longtime China space industry marketing and sales extraordinaire, Mr. Kevin Shu, the chief marketing officer from Landspace. So we will be bringing that episode to you next month. We are very much looking forward to it and we very much encourage you to send any questions or comments or in interesting stories that you would like us to, to relay to Kevin during our conversation. We would be happy to, uh, to relay them. Please have them to us by November 8th and we will, we will, you know, we will do what we can. Uh, so that is the, uh, the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace News Roundup, CCAF edition part one. Uh, Jean, anything else from your side before we, before we wrap it up? Um, j maybe just add to, to send us the, the questions, do it through dfhour at gmail.com or you can send us the questions in the comments of this video or through Twitter, all three are just fine. And that, that, will, be, that will be it for me. Thank you for watching. Thank you all, have a good day. Bye.